and I'm now with Plan West Partners as of February of this year, full time. Uh, so, um, going to be talking about uh, the Crescent City Economic Development Strategic Action Plan um, that Plan West uh, just completed and City Council just adopted uh, in late June, so less than a month ago. Uh, and Eric Weir is the city manager um, that really led uh, that project with his staff. Uh, and so I'm going to pass it over to Eric. Uh, Eric's going to talk a little bit about you know, where the city is, um, what the city's interest was for this document, and then um, I'll get into all the details. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. So yeah, so my name is Eric Weir, city manager, city of Crescent City. Uh, this has been a, been a great project uh, to be a part of, great project to work on. Definitely commend uh, Rob and, and Colette and the staff there at Plans West for, uh, for taking us through what was really a, an evolution as far as this project goes. But Crescent City is a is an interesting area, you know, being part of the North Coast. I'm sure, you know, many of you are aware of Crescent City and the, the challenges, you know, that, that we face and the, really the endless potential that I believe all of the communities have here on the North Coast. I mean, we we have it all, right? The, we have the beaches, the redwoods, we have the uh, the rivers that, that flow, flow through the, uh, the area and the uh, just the potential for for economic development has always been here, yet I think it's probably a true statement in, in each of our communities that we haven't lived up to that full potential yet. You know, every community has their certain challenges. Uh, remoteness affects us all uh, here on the North Coast. Uh, you have the, the highways, you know, in and out in Crescent City with last chance grade certainly is at the forefront of challenges in regard to transportation. And then you have some of the, you know, the natural disasters that that have affected, you know, especially Crescent City, but really the North Coast, uh, you know, to a certain extent in one form or another over, over the course of time. Crescent City, though, being hit by the 1964 tsunami really sort of changed the landscape of our city uh, uh, and has changed it forever. You know, the half of the city, 29 total blocks were destroyed in 1964. The Army Corps of Engineers came in, rebuilt very quickly. Uh, Comeback Town USA, right, which was a huge sort of rally cry and what a great accomplishment it was. And they rebuilt the town in the 60s and it still looks like that. And right? it looks like 1960s strip mall in the downtown where you can't really decipher the, the quaintness or the, uh, the, the true history of our area because it was rebuilt at that time. And so those are some of the challenges, you know, that, that we have faced. But we didn't really face an economic really downturn because right after the 60s, we rebuilt the town, we had the logging, we had fishing. And so that carried us through the, the 70s into the 80s. But now what we saw is we saw those industries go away. But again, there was kind of that saving grace that was out there. And that's, that's Pelican Bay State Prison for us. Uh, that was that, that influence of jobs and economy, which really led us to, to really lean on that and be dependent on it, uh, which is good and bad, right? It, you had this, the, the industries going away, yet you had sort of this, this other thing that came in and said, you don't necessarily have to do anything about this because there's this other piece of it. And so that's led Crescent City to, to where it is really today, which is endless potential still, which is great and the opportunities are there, yet still not fully developing those into what we, what we can become. So that's really the, the crux of this project is to focus in on economic development. We went out, we received a CDBG grant uh, for, I think it was approximately uh, $100,000 to complete this particular project, went out for an RFP, uh, and that's where Plan West came in, Rob Colette, blew us away in the, uh, in the interviews and we were off and running. Uh, that was, I wanna say somewhere around, right around the first part of 2020. It was before, uh, before the pandemic hit. It might've been even late of, of 2019 when we first authorized the contract. Then the pandemic hit. Everybody's rocked at, at this point, right? Everybody's sort of reeling. We, we gathered with, you know, I'm looking at the list of attendees, several names on this list. We were. Uh, involved in meetings. You probably worked with Holly Went uh, as part of uh, our staff, and we're all thinking about economic development. How do we survive this from not only the, the health crisis, but also the economic crisis? And so now that was in front of us. And really what that says is 
we need to have the resiliency to, to be able to withstand these things. And that's really what this project is about. And this is a, this is the time, right? And that's what really this, this is an opportunity for city of Crescent City through this economic development project, but also the region, small towns across the United States. And I'm sure Rob will, will dive into this. This is our time to redevelop, to rebuild, to reimagine what it is, because there, if there's one thing that is for sure is that we're in a time of change. Remote working, right? There's gonna be pieces of that. The, the way people travel, the way people explore, that's all changing. Some of the things that have hindered us for years are no longer as big of a, of a obstacle to overcome. Our remoteness might just be one of our biggest assets at this point because people don't wanna work in the cities anymore and they don't have to. So, you know, it's really, it's, it's how do we take advantage of it? From our standpoint, some of the key things that, that Rob and his team have pointed out uh, are, the, are some of those things that we need to focus in on. And that's like partnerships. You'll, you'll hear, I'm sure Rob talked about it. Partnerships are gonna be key. Having all of our arrows sort of align and, and be able to focus on things are also going to be key. And also being versatile. You know, we, we have to be versatile. And so what you'll hear Rob talk about is in this plan, there, there are tools. Uh, he's gonna call them recipes, but, but really they're, they're economic development tools and different sort of strategies that depending on what we're faced with, right, we can pull those tools out and try to use those in these different circumstances. And so that's that's kind of my my intro spiel on it. That's why I'm excited about this project. That's why I think Crescent City, really the North Coast as a whole is in a prime position to take advantage uh, of this economic development climate. Uh, and we'll do so with, uh, with you know, tools like what this uh, has to offer. So with that, Rob, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over back to you unless there's any, any more you, uh, you want me to say about it. Uh, no, I think that's perfect, though. I encourage you to uh, jump in at any point in this presentation and you know, feel free to, to throw thoughts in the middle. And, and likewise, for anyone in the audience um, that wants to ask questions. So I'm going to dive right into this. Uh, anyone that's seen me present before knows that I jam pack as much as I can into a short period of time. Um, so this, this has got a lot here. I'm going to go kind of fast. Um, so it was really uh, immediately in the project that uh, Eric and city staff made it clear that they didn't want another document sitting on a shelf gathering cobwebs. And everybody says that, uh, and no consultant means to produce a document like that or city staff, anyone that produces a tech technical document doesn't want to see that happen. But we put a lot of thought into like, why does that happen specifically with economic development strategic plans? And so we looked at some economic development strategic plans. Here's an example from another community. And most economic development plans look like this. And they've got a list of things that the city wants to accomplish. And so for instance, develop workforce housing plan. Well, that's pretty much all this document says about that. And it's like, okay, uh, what does that mean? How do you do that? Uh, or promote and attract outdoor recreation businesses. Wonderful. That's a, a wonderful goal. But what does that mean? How do you do it? And that's, I think, why these documents end up on shelves. Or another example from another community, uh, increase the supply of office and industrial spaces. Spectacular. I love that idea. Well, how do you do that exactly? Or explore opportunities for marketing the city as a place to do business via the airport and train depots. Much better, more specific, but still it's a single sentence and the vast majority of economic development plans have a hundred of these single sentences that are kind of difficult to determine what to do with them or how you go about it. City manager can't just hand this to a, a staff member and say, go to do that, that thing, because what, what does that thing even mean? So that was the inspiration behind this document is to try to do something different. And, and I applaud uh, the, the council and the, our technical advisory committee and city staff um, for um, kind of pushing us towards this unique approach to economic development planning. So. Uh, this is, these are all screen captures of the actual documents, uh, and so there's a lot of people to thank. There was a technical advisory committee of business owners, uh, a lot of city staff involved. Uh, shout out to Colette Metz-Sanchi of Plan West, who was the project manager and really made this whole project happen. Uh, and then in the document right before even the table of contents is testimonials from four businesses. This document is as much a recruitment tool to new businesses or even grant agencies. And so we wanted it to be something right up front where local businesses gave a testimony as to how much they love doing business in Crescent City. 
Then we've got four main sections of the documents, uh, and I'm going to go through uh, mostly part three and, and four, um, but give you a quick sneak peek at parts one and two. So there was a public engagement component where we did a survey, and the vast majority of people thought that beautification, tourism, uh, stimulating development, attracting jobs, and enhancing downtown um, were where the city should be putting its economic development efforts. Um, when residents were asked what would make them happier, uh, increased health care options and more small businesses, more events and things to do. So uh, important information there that we utilized in developing a lot of the projects. And then this word cloud of the one word that represents uh, Crescent City's future. So we had nearly 100 people participate in this survey and uh, the public meeting that went with it. And you can see a lot of really uh, positive uh, opportunity uh, based words there. So then uh, the document goes into kind of a definition of what is economic development and the city's parks and rec director um, really um, pushed us on this and you know, said like, well, what is economic development? I don't even know that council members really quite understand what economic development is. So we came up with this uh, matrix here uh, and I've got a 20 minute version of this. I'll give you the, the three minute version. So there are, uh, there's a spectrum of types of economic development from business specific economic development that benefits or is focused on a single specific business and then broad community oriented economic development that looks at an entire community. And then there are levels of economic developments um, from envisioning and ideation all the way up to implementation. So, you know, kind of planning or coming up with the idea at the bottom uh, and then construction at the top. And so you can break this into four grids. You've got the envisioning of business specific projects, kind of like business planning, uh, implementation of business specific projects, the creation of a new manufacturing facility, the envisioning of community benefit projects, kind of like a general plan, uh, and then the implementation of community benefit projects like the building of a wastewater treatment plant. So these are the, the categories of economic development. So you know, you've got different people that fall into these different sectors. Uh, and you know different uh, job types. Um, so with the regional transportation planning agencies, kind of halfway between envisioning and ideation and implementation, uh, but they're really more broad community oriented. Whereas a lending institution is also halfway between envisioning and, and implementation. Somebody comes in once alone to start a business, uh, but they're much more business specific. And you know, chambers of commerce kind of fall into the middle of this this grid. And so these are different uh, activities of economic development from beautification or business planning that you know, fall into this, uh, to this matrix. And then you can take any specific project and falls into this matrix. So the Crescent City Beachfront Park Master Plan uh, you know, started down here as just a skinny little guy that's more broad community oriented. It's kind of towards business specific a little bit because it's you know, in a certain part of town and some businesses will benefit more than others. But as the city acquires more grants and gets more studies done and gets closer and closer to construction, this box can grow up towards implementation. And so, you know, recruiting Nordic Aqua uh, Farm in Humboldt County, uh, you know, started out as an idea and it's getting bigger and bigger and closer and closer to implementation. And so any project can fall into this matrix and, you know, be a skinny, um, you know, little thing or it can grow and become bigger over time. I find that most projects are kind of you know stuck on this business specific broad community oriented scale, uh, but they grow in height over time as they come closer and closer to construction. So that's uh, all laid out is you know what is economic development setting the stage, and then we looked at the county's comprehensive economic development uh, strategy, the SEDS, the the county SEDS, which was just completed months before we uh, you know right at the, as we were starting this project. And what we say is that the county SEDS plus this document is really the comprehensive guide to economic development in the greater Crescent City area. They complement each other and were designed specifically to do that. So for instance, uh, the next couple of pages go into detail at analyzing what the SEDS um, said and kind of synthesizing the results. And so looking at changes of employment or unemployment trends over time, this was literally adopted weeks before the COVID uh, uh, impact. So uh, the, you know, the trends of uh, unemployment there from the SEDS show unemployment dropping and then everything's looking great. Uh, and had it been published you know, four months later, it would look very different. 
So um, the county SEDS goes into a detailed uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis. And we looked at that and built off of that for the ideas in this document. And then also had goals, which are kind of similar to the, the projects I was pointing to from other communities, such as um, you know, consider increasing the TOT rate or um, support K-12 tech ed. So great goals. I think the, the, uh, the team that produced this county SEDS did a great idea, a great job of coming up with these 30 plus goals. Um, we wanted to build on these and make them more specific. And so every one of those uh, county SEDS goals is reflected in a more specific project in this document. And then we also uh, looked at, um, I think, 16 or so um, past studies that were related to economic development and made sure that we captured all the ideas and projects from those. And then as Eric pointed out, uh, this you know, economic development in Crescent City isn't going to happen without partnerships. And so we broke down all the possible partnerships that we could think of. And, and I actually um, will build on that in a moment, come back to it. Uh, and this is actually an older version. So we, we built on this more, uh, but the document repeatedly refers to the organizations in this chart uh, and says, maybe that entity could do this project instead of the city and really constantly trying to find other people to take on economic development projects. Then we've got uh, the economic development goals. And um, I'm actually gonna come back to this, but important to point out that there are some underlying goals built into all city efforts. So these are the foundation of the goals of so poverty reduction, equity and inclusion, health, and then youth development empowerments. And those are the foundation um, for the nine goals in this document. And we're gonna come back to those. So um, hang on for that. And then my animation is really slow. Okay. Um, we also looked at target industry sectors. So where uh, does the city want to um, build more jobs? And so there's in past documents, this team's approach here of transportation, technology, tourism, education, environment, agriculture, forestry, fishing, manufacturing, medicine, small business, and sovereign nation success. So building on that, we came up with these industry sectors and um, I won't go into too much detail on that. We also looked at economic development districts and broke the city into different quadrants, looking at how different economic development projects would fit in different parts of town. And as I go over the projects, each project uh, identifies which target industry sector uh, jobs would be created in through that project, as well as which part of town would benefit in these economic development districts. And then very late in the project, uh, we came up with this section here, preparing for a post-pandemic economy and, you know, foreseeing that the pandemic was coming to an end. How is the world going to be different than it was before? And what can Crescent City do to seize those opportunities? And so it really starts with this question of what will Crescent City be like in the year 2071, 50 years from now? Uh, and it's easy to think, you know, it's going to be all super sci-fi and we're going to walk around on, you know, floating cars. Um, but I ask, how much has Crescent City really changed since 1971? Uh, you know, we still go to our kids' baseball games on the weekends, we, just like we did in 1971. Still have 40-hour work weeks. We drive to work. You know, life's really not that fundamentally different. We have phones in our pocket instead of tethered to the wall. But for the most part, life's really not that different than it was. Uh, I think there's been a lot of improvements in social justice, and we have a long way to go. And so we'll, what will the city look like in, in the year 2071? So we looked, uh, and this is kind of the more academic component of the document here. Um, these uh, projected post-pandemic economic trends. So uh, population redistribution, oh, sorry. Uh, and, you know, this is climate change um, migration and, and, you know, population pressures in urban areas, housing shortages in the Bay Area and LA. And so looking at uh, population redistribution, we've been seeing this for a while, and now it seems like it's even more uh, of a, a possibility. Virtual healthcare and telemedicine, um, virtual workplaces and telecommuting. Um, the metamorphosis of retail is a lot of talk about the death of retail. I, I strongly believe that retail is never going to die. It's just going to metamorphize. And, you know, there are now uh, grocery stores with video arcades and bowling alleys in them. And, you know, it becomes a place to, to be. And so even if you can do all of your shopping from home, people still want to get out and see each other. And so um, retail is just simply going to change uh, and maybe there'll be less of it. Uh, downtowns have suffered from regional malls and, and still survived. And so uh, our downtowns are going to, they're going to uh, change, uh, but not die. 
then there's new tourism, uh, adventure, travel, road trips, and workations. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and then there's a whole lot of new technologies coming, social ex expectations and climate change. And then really, you know, once the pandemic's over, Crescent City is going to get right back to normal, where it's constantly pursuing 100 small wins. And, you know, there's, there's too much work, not enough staff, and a lot of great ideas. And so to a large degree, things will return to normal, at least in that sense. Oh, that's what that was doing. Okay. So uh, a couple of just things I'll point out from this uh, when it comes to population redistribution. Uh, we, the nation experienced five times more remote work uh, during the pandemic than before the pandemic, uh, and that could prompt a large change in geography of work. Uh, so for instance, a, a former colleague uh, has um, just gotten a job with the state uh, housing and urban development department in a job that formerly would have been most definitely in Sacramento. And he now lives in Eureka and telecommutes every day. And he technically reports as a Sacramento employee. But his salary, whatever it is, somewhere between, say, fifty dollars and $100,000, is now being his cashes, his checks are being cashed in Eureka, whereas they would have been being cashed in Sacramento. And so Eureka is that much wealthier for having an employee that lives in Eureka, but actually is, has their job in Sacramento. And so like Eric was saying, this is a whole new opportunity for economic development in rural regions. And as long as you have good um, broadband uh, and you know, some, some savvy people, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity um, to bring some, some wealth into the community. Uh, healthcare from a distance, the pandemic demonstrated to many people the existence uh, and potential of virtual healthcare. There's some statistics in there. Uh, about uh, how much virtual healthcare there was prior to the pandemic and then during. Uh, shift in employment trends, telecommuting received a permanent boost due to the pandemic, according, and this, this is all footnoted, so this is kind of the academic part of the document. And uh, there are some communities that are actively importing people that work in other communities. So if you can telecommute, your, your job says you can telecommute, could you move from uh, Fresno to Crescent City and bring your job with you and continue to work remotely. If Crescent City could do that, if they could import 100 people that earn six-figure incomes, it would add $10 million to the community's annual collective payroll. And that is such an appealing option that these communities here are each paying people up to $15,000 per person to move to their community if they bring their job with them. And so, you know, that is, I think, you know, one of the futures of economic development we never would have imagined two years ago. Um, oh, so based on that, uh, you know, Crescent City can be able to create jobs and help existing local businesses merely by creating housing. So spoiler alert, our number one recommendation here, not just for this reason, but others as well, is for Crescent City to create more housing, um, their best uh, economic development opportunity. You can see here the plummet of uh, employment in the leisure and hospitality industry at the time that we published this document, uh, and that's actually rebounding now. Uh, and so Crescent City could see, continue to see a decline in brick and mortar retail stores uh, and should prepare accordingly, but it doesn't mean that the city should give up on retail. It just needs, we need to think about things a little bit differently. Workcations are, if you can work remotely uh, and your spouse can get off for a week, but you can't, could you go to Crescent City for a week and you work in the hotel during the day while your family's out playing on the beach and going into the Redwoods and going for hikes, and then you can join them for dinner downtown. Um, so I'm actually doing this in a couple of weeks. Um, and then there's, you know, artificial intelligence and self-driving cars and a whole lot of analysis of, you know, the possibilities of technology that will fundamentally change uh, our lives in new ways that they never have before. You know, SpaceX is launching 1,300 satellites with a plan for 30,000 satellites uh, and, you know, having broadband across the world anywhere, no matter where you are. And a lot of that seems unrealistic, like far-fetched science fiction, but exactly 100 years ago, only 35% of American households had electricity. And there were a lot of people at the time that said, we will never get to 100%. That's just impossible. You can't do that last mile everywhere. And so, um, you know, it was less than 100 years ago uh, that uh, Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean for the first time. 
So, um, you know, these virtual reality, extended reality, self-driving cars are in our future. And uh, while it seems like science fiction, it's something we should prepare for, especially in the economic development world. Mm -hmm. So of a, I think 350 page documents, that's just the intro. We're only on, you know, the early uh, pages here and we get to the economic development recipes. Before I get into that, uh, I said I would come back to these goals. So we've got these goals and this cookbook uh, has uh, nine sections. And so we've got nine goals. So each section of the cookbook uh, corresponds with one of the goals. And so what we've got is uh, economic development team and partnerships, data gathering and analysis, simplifying and streamlining regulations, stimulating housing development, retaining, creating jobs, infrastructures, economic development, beautification and tourism, uh, downtown enhancements and business acknowledgement. So those are the sections of the recipe book, um, like in a recipe book where you could have a uh, Tex-Mex section and a Chinese food section and breakfast and lunch, you know, so different sections of a cookbook. And so why do we call it a cookbook? We've got all these different recipes in these different sections. What has it got to do with a cookbook? Well, a cookbook is a collection of unprioritized recipes. You can do any one of them independent of the other. They don't need one another. Uh, and so these projects are it's set up in the same kind of way where you can pick just randomly through the document, pick one, and you don't need the others to get it done. And then each is individually achievable. It's not overwhelming or intimidating. Give someone a cookbook and say, do all of this. And that's overwhelming, but say, pick any recipe here and do it. It shouldn't be nearly as overwhelming just to do one. And in that spirit, we set up this document so that uh, every recipe has a list of ingredients, step-by-step -step instructions who can do it, uh, et cetera. So I'll show you an example. So we've got 132 unique recipes in those nine sections. And so here's the very first one, give away this plan. So if we drill in on it, we've got the ingredients, you need email, photocopier, or a local coffee or copy shop. And this is gonna take anywhere between one hour and a few dozen hours of staff time. And then the budget's anywhere between $0 to send some emails to $6,500 to print 50 copies and then mail them out uh, to various people. And here's a description of uh, this, doc or this recipe uh, and then the directions for how to go about it, which goes on to the next page. Right, yep. And then uh, at the bottom of that page, the next page, uh, we see which goals are addressed and which recipe this recipe pairs with and who can do it. Uh, and then the districts serve back to that map. So that was recipe 1A, jumping all the way to recipe 10. So there's you know 15 recipes between them, just as another example, enhance and upgrade the sister city relationship and instructions on how to do that, or a leadership uh, Del Norte program like the uh, Eureka Chamber of Commerce recently uh, initiated. Uh, a leadership Eureka program. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you some examples. Um, request new recipes from everyone and accept all submittals. So uh, instructions here on how to create a contest and people can submit new recipes to add to this book. Uh, it's certainly not done. It could have another hundred recipes that other community members and organizations can come up with. Hopefully the, the Crescent City Chamber of Commerce comes up with some great ideas. Uh, and so you can have contests like most creative recipe, most transformative best, best youth recipe, have us an award ceremony, uh, council can you know, pick their favorite one. There's lots of different ways to do it. So there's options built into this. And going into section two, which is data gathering and analysis, just uh, an example, vacancy rate analysis. And so step-by-step -step instructions on how to um, do a vacancy rate analysis either. And a lot of these have options for how staff can do it or how much it would cost to hire a consultant to do it. Uh, and so these can be, become the formation of uh, requests for proposals. Another idea is uh, to improve and promote the city's park score. So the Trust for Public Lands has come up with this concept of park score. And so uh, Bandon, Oregon has a park score of 40. Brookings, Oregon uh, has a park score of 61. Crescent City, 64. Eureka, 83. Ashland, 86. And they use uh, a pretty sophisticated uh, algorithm uh, to give a city a score based on um, census data and uh, income and racial equity and, and walkability to parks. And so using that system, uh, you know, and, and for most communities in the country, you can go to their website and get a free, uh, for every community, you can get a free park score. But for most of them, it's a pretty rough number. Uh, and so I think Crescent City score would actually be higher. 
and there's a system you can go online and plug in more data. So for the top 100 cities, the organization actually goes in and really drills in on the numbers. Uh, every other community, they do their best guess through some quick GIS, um, but you have the ability to go in and fix it. So uh, not only could Crescent City improve their park score probably just by fix fixing some data, but also see where their weak spots are uh, and then use that to say like, hey, we really need to think about it. Just a small neighborhood park over here would really help um, our park score and make us a more equitable community um, where people in lower income neighborhoods uh, can walk to a park. Uh, there's a business outreach program uh, recipe, which is I think you know expected for an economic development strategic plan, um, business license innovation. Um, back to that very first recipe I showed about give away this plan, um, the city's encouraging any community that is interested in any of these recipes to take any idea from here. Uh, if you use 10% of it or 100% of it, if, if your community is looking at business license innovation right now, uh, feel free to, to take this and, and use it in your own community. Accessory dwelling unit program and how to create more uh, mother-in-law units. Uh, how to get 100 new housing units in the permit pipeline. Uh, and then another one I want to dwell on for a moment here is downtown housing um, 40 unit plan, how to get 40 units in the downtown. I'm good, I'm doing good on time. And so uh, Crescent City's downtown, as Eric said, I think 29 blocks um, were destroyed and you know effectively rebuilt. And Crescent City had a nice old town that looked similar to Eureka's old town. Uh, and then in the 1960s, when, when we as a society were in love with cars and parking lots, uh, the city with the downtown was redesigned with a lot of parking lots, small single story buildings in the back of the lots. And it's kind of confusing. Uh, you know, strip mall is something we've all experienced at downtown, something we've all experienced. But when you drive through Crescent City, there's, you know, at least as an urban planner, and I think probably everyone on this call, something feels a little strange. And it's because you've got a strip mall on a grid. So it's a perfect grid. It's got sidewalks. It's it's really a nice urban grid that that's, you know, right by the ocean. And yet there's all these parking lots in the corners, which is really counter to, uh, you know, the, the 1890s, 1910s era of when that grid was built. And so that's, that's a consequence of the tsunami. And so can the city re-envision its downtown? So this is Windsor, uh, California. And I see this big park here and some nice trees and a simple street and then a row of buildings right behind the back of the walk. It's, this is called a street wall. And so I look at Crescent City's um, beachfront park and um, uh, front street. And if we were standing on that arrow looking in that direction, this is what we would see. And you see Seaquake back here is a, a really wonderful utilization of this space. It's a, it's a business and a building that's worthy of this place. You know, you got your, the ocean off to your right and a park. But most of the buildings along front street um, uh, are not uh, that impressive. And so could we envision something like this, where this is beachfront park? We've got a street with trees and buildings. And so the city's already done a great job of envisioning uh, Beachfront Park and uh, doing improvements on Front Street uh, are already well underway. Um, but could we, you know, forgive me for this sad little photo simulation, but now can we envision a row of buildings along every block on the other side of Front Street facing uh, Beachfront Park? Uh, and so could Crescent City's downtown look like this? Um, certainly seems feasible. We're not talking about giant buildings, three-story buildings, residential on the upper floors, retail on the bottom floor. Sometimes it could just be office and, and real estate offices. It could be even residential on the ground floor. Um, you know, some nice design standards. Maybe we can get a little ambitious and talk about four-story buildings. Um, Maybe we get even more ambitious and start, you know, getting bigger. But however the city envisions its downtown, I this is also one of our top recommendations is for the city to really embrace a new vision for the downtown. And so uh, I was talking to Bob Brown of uh, uh, SHN the other day, and uh, the SHN is doing the city's housing element. So what I told him is, in doing an economic development plan, it's easy for me to throw out big crazy ideas. He's got the hard work of actually doing uh, the, the housing element and figuring out how um, to make that happen. But here's my proposed uh, outline of Crescent City's new downtown and even includes a little bit beyond city limits up here. Right now, this is the city's um, waterfront commercial zone district and this is the city's downtown. And you can see this perfect grid 
ocean views. You got a park here. You've got elementary schools, uh, you know, community parks, the, the Board of Supervisors. There are so much potential inside of this red boundary for re-envisioning. And even these two zone districts have you know, very short uh, building standards, uh, unnecessarily high parking standards, easy for me to say, but uh, I always say parking standards are too high. So I recommend uh, that the city call this downtown, do a rezone, do a general plan, do a specific plan, get rid of parking standards, uh, and uh, sh shoot for some three and four story buildings. And other communities are doing the same currently. Uh, so Fortuna is in the process right now of a uh, specific plan for the mill district right here. Uh, and we just started this specific plan. This area is 50% of the size of what I envision as Crescent City's downtown. Uh, it's uh, got practically no roadway infrastructure. And you know how much housing could the city envision there? We'll, we'll see, we just started with the project. Uh, but think about the, the difficulty of creating something here where there are no roads, uh, there's you know very little utilities, you're really starting from scratch. Then you've got something that's a little bit easier, Arcata's uh, Gateway District, also working on a general plan and area plan on this one currently uh, here at Plan West. And so this is only 60% of the size of that Crescent City downtown. It's got far fewer vacant parcels than Crescent Cities. Uh, the roadway infrastructure is not nearly as developed. You've got a lot of gaps and missing blocks. And yet the city is envisioning around 3,000 new housing units in this area, potentially. We're still in the process of that, so that's not official. Um, but that is a lot of housing in this area that's 60% of the size of Crescent City's downtown. So what could we do here? Well, if you look at vacant and underutilized parcels, there's a lot of development potential here. And in Arcata, if we jump back to Arcata, this little building right here, if we look at that and we just grab it, it looks like this. Uh, so you've got three-story building retail on the ground floor, approaching uh, 50 um, dwelling units. So you pick that up and you stick it in Crescent City at the same scale and put it on every vacant parcel. It would be pretty easy to get 30, what does that say? 36 new three-story buildings, 50 units per building. That would be 1,800 new units. In Crescent City, there's an average of 2.3 people per unit. So you're talking about more than 4,000 new people. That's a 62% increase in the city's population, all within a five-minute walk of the downtown core. And by standard methodologies, the residents looking at the average uh, median income in Crescent City those 4,000 people would earn 60 to $100 million annually in paychecks that aren't currently in the city. And they would spend two to $4 million on downtown dining. Uh, so if they each just spent 20 to $50 a month going out to eat, that would support two to 10 new restaurants exclusively supported by these new residents. So no tourists would have to eat there. No other residents of Del Norte County would have to eat there just these 4,000 new people and you could support somewhere between two and 10 restaurants depending on their income and how often they eat out. So uh, Virginia Main Street uh, developed the methodology for how to do this and I used all local um, data from census here. So um, I, I can put that in, link into the chat later if any community wants to use that, that methodology. Eureka's done an amazing job recently of uh, stimulating and envisioning big development downtown, uh, taking up parking lots and creating housing, um, really leading, I think, in the region on, on the boldness of these approaches. And so um, those are real possibilities. So Crescent City can do the same. If Eureka can do it, Crescent City can do it. Uh, and just to build on this a little bit further, this is this strategy is definitely the most fiscally responsible um, way to do new housing development. Perhaps the city could annex more lands that are currently redwoods, chop them all down, build some new streets, probably cul-de-sacs, four foot sidewalks, maybe five or six foot sidewalks, big wide streets. Um, the, the expense of building all of that new infrastructure for 4,000 new units would be phenomenally higher than what would be required to modify downtown. You've already got the grid and the sidewalks and the utilities and all the infrastructure. You know, maybe what I'm envisioning here exceeds the capacity of the wastewater treatment plant. That's a problem that uh, would be experienced in any part of town if it's going to connect to the plant. So uh, definitely the most fiscally responsible um, way to do new housing development. You've got existing roads and sidewalks and utilities. Also minimizes parking demand, saving uh, cost on parking infrastructure. It minimizes vehicle trips, um, saving cost of road maintenance. 
and it's good for climate change, minimizes school bus costs, uh, minimizes local, or maximizes local business opportunities. So uh, that, that's my soapbox. Oh, a little bit more. So just looking at this, you know, there's a lot of ways to envision this. So you could say down here, uh, closest to the park, um, with the ocean views, we're going to shoot for 50% of the, the units to have high-end housing, 40% to be market rate, and 10% to be affordable with ground floor retail and corners and some streets. And then for each part of the, you know, the, the specific plan area or the downtown area, you can come up with different standards and different goals. So that was that recipe. Um, another idea, and then these are, you know, I'm probably showing you 10% of the total of 140. Um, housing career awards, um, so ways that the city can celebrate and uh, recognize people that are actually producing housing. Uh, there's a business retention plan and a business recruitment plan, both of which are two pages. Um, recruiting distance workers, so that goes back to the, you know looking at those communities that are up here that are actually paying people to move to the city. Uh, you don't actually have to pay people to move, you can just create a promotional website uh, and you know, put out some YouTube videos about how great Crescent City is. Uh, and you know, if there was anybody out there that was looking at doing a, a documentary of Crescent City, by the way, every one of these recipes has a nice photo at the top. And so just by flipping through it, you kind of get uh, the idea of how much eye candy there is. Uh, and so this is document is in part a, a, a recruitment tool in itself, both for jobs people moving to the area or thinking about moving to the area, moving their business to the area, um, or, you know, grant funding agencies. Uh, it's, it's built to be just a nice thing to flip through, even if you don't want to read the words. Another idea here about recruiting government jobs. Um, so Caltrans, Forest Service, BLM, uh, all have a stake in Del Norte County, um, but uh, could definitely shift some of their workers around, especially with remote working. Um, so th these are ideas on how to call the right people and encourage them uh, to think long term about investing jobs into Del North County and in the present city. Uh, a whole set of ideas here about recruiting self-driving vehicle companies. Shout out to Eureka's, what was it called, the Moonshot Plan um, that kind of stimulated the idea for this. Um, there are companies out there that are currently testing self-driving cars. It's way easier to teach a self-driving car to drive on a nice, easy suburban road on you know flat near Fresno. Uh, Del Norte County's roads are much more complicated, and at some point, self-driving cars are going to get good enough that they're going to need harder roads to be tested on. And so, Crescent City can pass a resolution, work with the county, and start recruiting these self-driving vehicle companies. Hey, come try them out in Crescent City. Um, you know, maybe you can have your hotels give them a discount. Uh, you know, there's all different kinds of ideas in here on how to recruit them. Recruiting tech companies. Um, so this one is a bit of a wild idea. So if we take uh, this one's a privately owned lot, it's a quarter of a block, currently a parking lot. And if we, it's a 12,000 square foot lot. And if we put uh, ground floor parking on the bottom floor, doesn't require any ramps, so there's no loss of efficiency there. Put a corner coffee shop in. There's the parking, maybe a little corner store in that corner. This is directly across the street from the current city hall. Then do a residential floor with 24 units of 500 square foot units, kind of small uh, you know, units there. Another floor with 12 units of 10 or 1,000 square feet each. And then the, the luxury units, 1,500 square feet, eight units. And then a whole floor of conference center, event space, and workspace. And then rooftop gardens and a lounge, maybe a restaurant up there on the roof. And then try to recruit somebody like Tesla or Apple or Texas Instruments to take this lot, build this building, uh, and move these people to the community of Crescent City. And so maybe these are all just apartments that uh, they can have people come for retreats. Maybe the people live here full time and work remotely. Maybe they work out of their house. Maybe they work up here in the conference center. There's all kinds of possibilities. Uh, but the benefit to Crescent City uh, would be substantial. And so what does the city get out of this? Well, they'd get 44 units of downtown housing, probably with residents that make pretty good salaries that are going to be looking for coffee shops and restaurants, at least 44 jobs, presence of a well-funded and influential tech business, 10 to $20 million modern building. I totally just made up those numbers, but it seems like in the right range. Uh, 
And then on the fifth floor, maybe this 12,000 square foot conference space is something, you know, the city would ask the business to make available for weddings or big community events. Corner coffee shop, uh, and I didn't even mention the rooftop, you know, garden and uh, restaurant where you can sit and watch the, uh, the seals frolic in the ocean. So we wrote a letter to Elon Musk uh, and, you know, here's our convincing argument as to why this is such a good idea. And here's our uh, little cartoon of what that looks like. And then we haven't done it yet, but I'm encouraging the city to take that letter, modify a little bit, fold it up, stick it in an envelope and send it to Elon Musk, send it to Tesla. In fact, customize 20 of them and send them to every big tech company that you can think of in the country and just see if you get any bites. Maybe it would take staff member four hours uh, and maybe $5 worth of postage. And then, you know, maybe nothing happens, but uh, you know, you never know. So what would this look like in downtown? Um, be the tallest building in the city. This is right across the street from city hall or a street. Uh, and here's just a quick cartoon of that same building. Oh, um, what was I oh, you can see the uh, the utility pole here. Um, so that's how I scaled this up. And then that top floor would have amazing views of the ocean and of Redwood National Park over here on this side. Then there's uh, the section uh, of the recipe book, Infrastructure as Economic Development. So a beachfront park master plan. This image here is the most recent uh, master plan that the city has. And so that uh, photo I was showing before was from over here, looking this way. And so this is the city's um, vision for this and actively working on acquiring grants. And it also includes really impressive improvements to Front Street with angles in parking and set aside parking. And so that's well underway. And so this is really just encouragement to keep going a little bit of cheerleading there on that one. Elk Creek Park strategic plan. So this is Beachfront Park up here, and this is downtown Crescent City. This um, watershed is Elk, Creek. And there was recently a study uh, by one of the state agencies on restoration in here. Uh, but the opportunity for recreation is also phenomenal. And so this uh, encourages, you know, something like what uh, Eureka did with a boardwalk through a marsh, uh, lots of opportunity for amazing recreation within a five minute walk of that new envisioned downtown. Recruiting wind farms, uh, both uh, land-based and water-based, um, uh, inspired by uh, Humboldt County Harbor District. Attracting more day visitors. This is something I'd encourage every community in the North Coast region to do. So uh, there are, what does I say, like 200,000 people within a five mile or five hour drive radius of Crescent City. And so like, most communities in the region, Crescent City invests in tourism marketing, but all of that tourism marketing is trying to get people from Germany and Iowa and Florida to come to Crescent City. And Crescent City really just doesn't invest in trying to recruit people from Eureka or Trinidad uh, to come to Crescent City. And so if say just 10% of the population of Arcata came to Crescent City once a year for a weekend for a day trip even, that would make a big difference for Crescent City. And likewise, if 10% of the population of Crescent City decided to go to Trinidad in Humboldt County once a year, that would be a big deal for the city of Trinidad. And so uh, all of our communities can market to one another uh, and try to recruit each other for our events and you know get more connected and have the cities talk to each other more and say like, hey, we've got this really cool event coming up next week. Can you market in your community and, and we'll uh, reciprocate the next time you have an event? Uh, then a wild idea here about uh, Crescent City Ocean Warrior Award. This is kind of just a ploy for publicity, uh, but also an opportunity to uh, demonstrate Crescent City's values. So uh, I'll issue an award to Leonardo DiCaprio for his recent work in trying to save dolphins. I think he donated $10 million to uh, an ocean preservation organization. And so uh, Crescent City can call him an ocean warrior, hold a big party, invite him, hope he shows up, maybe a, a publicist would show up, uh, and there's, you know, different categories, uh, and so it's a way of both, both promoting uh, the, the value of Crescent City's uh, interest in the ocean and the preservation of ocean and ecology, as well as a way to um, get some marketing. 
this idea, uh, I seem to be the only one that likes this, but uh, North Coast Ring Fest would be a week long festival that goes from Fort Bragg to Crescent City each day of the week, different events happening in each community along the way. And so there could be a surf contest and a dancing in the rain contest, an umbrella parade, all kinds of ideas. Each community can do their own thing. Uh, and I'm thinking of, you know, like when people follow a band like AEDC, but this is, you know, the rain fest. So we pray for rain and there's a stop along the way in each community. Each community has, you know, a different kind of festival or event for a day or two. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, planet, I looked up on NOAA's website and this is the week that has the highest probability of rain in our region. It also happens to be close to President's Week when a lot of kids have off school and maybe families would look to travel. And if you market it really big, uh, you can, you know, if each community dedicated $10,000 to this effort, including the counties, you could raise $100,000 in coming up with this event and promoting it. And a lot of people have said, well, what if it doesn't rain? And then I said, you know, well, our tour is really going to complain if they go, if they come here and it doesn't rain and uh, you know, they have a great time anyway. So it's a win-win. Um, Crescent City Redwood Canopy Walk, uh, taking a, a play out of uh, Eureka's book. Um, could Crescent City do this? Uh, so this looks in detail at a number of different locations. I think seven different candidate locations and there's already one at uh, the Trees of Mystery. So uh, I think that Eureka's Canopy Walk might be even more popular if there were a cluster of them in the region. And so if Del Norte County could do another one and Humboldt could do another one and there were five or six, I think that would not become competition, um, but it would actually be uh, something that you know, would draw even more tourists because then we could become the Canopy Walk region. Then there's the downtown enhancement section, which has got the most recipes. And so we broke that up into categories of uh, envisioning planning and strategy, vacancy reduction and beautification. And uh, Stephen, stop me. I know we have five minutes left. So let's see here. I'm really close though. For anyone that uh, works with the city, um, the National League of Cities has a five day program for uh, the Vacant Property Leadership Institute. Uh, it's currently virtual. I think they're going back to in-person. Uh, and it is in a different city each year, but uh, you know, probably a bit of exp an expense to uh, invest a staff member to get this training, uh, but apparently has really great results uh, and goes into a remarkable detail. And you actually have to submit a lot of information ahead of time. And then there's a, a, um, a coalition of uh, experts that help solve vacancy problems for each community during the five-day workshop. Um, so coming to the end here, looks like I'm going to cut short the, uh, the question and answer. City can't do 132 projects at the same time. So how do they prioritize, need a tool? So we analyzed all these projects by their level of impact from minor to substantial and the timing of their outcome, whether it was immediate or delayed. And so this is measured by time and this is measured by some amount of change, whether it's jobs or money or construction. And so like the other uh, matrix, you've got four grids, substantial impact with immediate outcomes, that's big changes quickly, substantial impact with delayed outcomes, that's big changes slowly, minor impacts with immediate outcomes, that's small changes quickly, and minor impacts with delayed outcomes, small changes slowly. The one way to look at this is this is the magic rainbow unicorn of economic development. It's what everybody wants, right? You want big impacts really fast. And the equivalent for your personal finances is winning the lottery, but it's a magic rainbow unicorn. It's very uh, unlikely in economic development, uncommon, I should say. Then you've got the sad clown of economic development where you make really tiny changes that take a long time. You don't wanna be down in that corner. Uh, and so that's unrealistic and this is undesirable. And so the, the result is, is that most economic development projects end up on this kind of difficult to define little river of economic development. And that's because if you have a project and it's got a minor impact and can happen quickly and you say, I wanna increase its impact, I wanna make this more meaningful. Well, you can move it, but it's gonna take a little bit longer. And you say, I wanna really increase its impact, sure, no problem, but it's gonna take that much longer. And so in reality, projects just end up on this river in economic development. One way to think about it is pushing a rock up a hill. It's, it's on that slope, 
when you're at the very bottom, you can move it a little bit. It didn't take very long. If you want to move it all the way to the top, it's going to take a long time. And that's just how economic development works. Uh, big impacts take time. So we use this tool to come up with our top recommendations. And they are um, staff up for economic developments, uh, the city to invest in a staff member to uh, implement these projects, and then to re-envision downtown with a specific plan. Those are the top two projects. Though we did uh, come up with, you know, 25 other ones, but I will skip that in the interest of one minute of questions. Thank you, Rob. Do we have any questions coming in at this point? I don't see any questions. I did get a comment from Mary Burke that uh, says that she likes your Rainfest idea and that it aligns with steelhead season but I do not have any questions. One thing I forgot to mention, the impetus for that rain fest was uh, trying to get people to stay in hotels in the off season. So creating a big event in the summer when most of our hotels is full, isn't very strategic, uh, but getting a whole bunch of people to our region in February uh, is strategic. And so great if a community wants to do a steelhead, uh, you know, fishing tour or something like that, it would fit in with that rain fest. Uh, and I encourage anyone to, to steal that idea. Thank you very much, Rob. Eric, any comments? No, just like uh, just like everyone can see here, and lots of potential here. In the uh, you have to have optimism, uh, and that's exactly what we have right here. And we you stick to this plan. The worst thing that we can do as a city is to let this plan sit on the shelf. So it's got to be out there. We have to be looking for these things. There. Uh, the the other thing that's that's in front of us all right now is the ARPA funds. So. We've talked about some of these things. It takes resources. The guidelines still haven't come out for the ARPA funds, but we're looking at that as a key de economic development resource for us to use and to be able to implement these things. We need to have the staff. To be honest, we need somebody like Rob to be able to drive some of these things to, to make some of these things happen. So one uh, question, and that is, uh, you have a coastal zone plan there, and are you taking that into account as you're looking forward to these projects? You know, we do, we are, you know, in the coastal zone, we do have a local coastal plan. That is something that's going to have to be considered with some of these projects. Some of them fall in the coastal zone. Some of them don't fall in the coastal zone. Uh, but yeah, it's something that Crescent City has to live with and, you know, and adapt uh, to whenever we're talking about any project. All right. Well, thank you. Well, as anybody watching this can see, Rob is both creative in his ideas and uh, quite extraordinary in his use of PowerPoint presentations. He's able to convey a lot of information with a lot of enthusiasm in a pretty short, compact piece of time. And uh, if you were as excited about this process as I got just watching this, uh, you know that it takes some muscle at the other end, political will to put these things into place. But that's what planners do is that they give people the opportunities to have a plan that they can implement. And I think Rob is, is doing an extraordinary job along with Colette. On this project. So uh, congratulations to uh, Eric for having this project come forward and Rob for your participation today helping us understand it. It's been an honor to work with the city. Um, I have a, a soft spot for Crescent City. We go up every year. We're actually going up next weekend uh, and staying in Crescent City with my wife and kids. So uh, I, I can't wait to see Crescent City implement some of these things. Um, Next week or next month, we will be having that, an update on the Humboldt County Coastal Plan. So you can tune in for uh, for that. Next month, it will be promoted to you, and you'll get a chance to sign in for that one as well. So with that, we will uh, end up recording. This uh, webinar is being recorded and will be put onto our um, uh, site. And there's a link for getting to that. We will send out again. So thank you all for attending, participants. And, and attendees. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks.